Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Michael Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Lopez. Thanks for tuning in. So welcome back to another episode of Wild and Exposed. Before we get started tonight, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for your comments, for your ideas. Keep them coming. If you would like to have us review your images, hashtag WE Photo Review on Instagram, and uh, we'll choose uh, several photos on an upcoming episode and get those images reviewed uh, on air. We'll have the YouTube feed for that as well, so you'll be able to see what we're looking at. Also, hope that you're all staying well in this crazy time that we're having. But let's jump into it. I'd like to welcome Jamin Taylor to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Jamin, is it Jay- you go by Jamin Hunter on Instagram, right? I always thought your last name was Hunter, but it must be you're obviously Jamin Taylor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my middle name is Hunter, and uh, I'll tell you a, a quick story about that. But my dad is an outdoorsman, you know, through and through. Uh, he moved up here on his honeymoon, and he always wanted a boy. So I, I have five sisters, and uh, I'm number I'm number four. And uh, he kept trying after me and kept getting girls. So so I was it. But uh, you know, he wanted to to name me Jamin Hunter Fisher Trapper T- Taylor, you know, all the stuff that he loved. <laughs> and my mom says, no, pick one. And so they, <laughs> they settled on Hunter. So, um, you know, it kind of, it, it kind of found its way back to me and kind of being appropriate to what I do. You know, I, he used to, uh, well, he's, he's, he still does. I mean, he's in his seventies, so he still gets out, but, um, you know, hunting and trapping and, and chasing moose through the woods. And, you know, I do the same thing, except I just shoot them with my camera instead of a gun. So uh, kind of mm-hmm. picked up, you know, after my dad and uh, found my own way back into the woods. So Hunter sounded really appropriate for my photography. Yeah, for sure. What's the weather like? Is, is it spring in Anchorage? Uh, well, it's spring number one. Let's put it that way. <laughs> First spring. Yeah, first That's... spring. Yeah, we, we, you know, it's it's so funny up here. It goes uh, usually March. We'll get a nice kind of a spring, and then, you know, the first part of April we'll get a nice big heavy snow, and then you know we'll get another break up, and then it'll get cold, and then we'll get another break up. You know, so it's just kind of the way it goes. You know, but yeah, we're on first spring right now. So a little overcast today, but uh, we're supposed to get sunny here. I think through the weekend. So. It's been warm here as well, but it's supposed to snow for the next few days off and on. So, uh, Jamin, we kind of crossed paths, I guess, through uh, a, another friend of the podcast, Jerry Herod. And yep. uh, you guys know each other and have shot together in the past, if if I understand correctly. Yep. And uh, one thing that Jerry suggested that we take a look at your bird content and in doing so saw some phenomenal um, bird images, particularly your loons. So if, we'll put your Instagram up so everybody can go take a look at those. But how did you, I mean, obviously you came from an outdoor family. How did you end up picking up the camera? Um, well, yeah, thank you. And uh, I kind of got interested in birds back in 2015. My son was like one year old and we were out camping at a nearby campground. And, you know, my wife and son were walking around this this campground uh, about 10 o'clock at night and I heard uh you know of course up here 10 o'clock at night you know the sun's still up and you know it's you know that the, mm. it's still light out so um but I heard this bird singing in the in the woods and I just had to find out what it was and um uh, I remember my dad talking about you know the first robins of the spring and all the warblers that came and you know all the other birds and my dad was always you know very in touch with nature and, and that sort of thing so it kind of sparked this man, you know, I just, I just thought, I wonder how many different species of birds are in Alaska, you know, just this question came up. Well, I first needed to find out what that bird was, because it just enchanted me, Uh, this beautiful sound coming from the forest, you know, and um, so after I found it, I found out it was a Swainson's thrush, and 
that kind of just triggered this love for birds. So I, I decided, you know, how many different species I could see for the rest of the year. And that was like June. I ended that year on like 75 species. So I kind of started out as a birder, bought a pair of binoculars and going out. And, and suddenly I, I got added to this uh, Facebook bird group called Birds of Alaska. And uh, I started seeing some really cool photos of birds. Some of the guys on there were really good, you know, and putting out some just some really nice photos. And I thought, man, I really want to do that because I had tried drawing them and stuff. And I've been an artist for as long as I can remember, you know, uh, drawing and clay, modeling clay when I was a kid and painting and all sorts of stuff. So I've always kind of had like a creative outlet, you know. So I decided I wanted to get a camera and try my hand at it. And so I bought a Canon SX50, which is like, you know, it had this like 50x super zoom, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, I was like, oh, hey, that's what I need. You know, I need that super zoom because I want to get up close. And so I bought that camera, and uh, it, it it just kind of frustrated me and wet my whistle. You know, I was like, man, I it's just not quite doing it. You know, once in a while I'd get one that was you know okay, but I decided I, I needed a, a DSLR. You know, something I could swap lenses out and whatnot. A buddy of mine was, you know, he had bought one of these Costco deals you know two lenses and whatnot and so it was a nikon d5100 and he had the lenses it was just sitting on a shelf collecting dust so i appraised it you know figured out what it was worth online what they were going for and i offered him cash for it and he wasn't using it so so he said sure so that was my first dslr and i took that around and i think it was like a 55 300 kit lens you know wasn't quite yep. doing it for me you know i was like oh man i need to i need to get closer so, you know, I bought the Sigma 150-500 for that, and that was okay. I used that for a little while, and then uh, I found a Tamron 150-600, so I, I swapped out because I wanted that extra 100 millimeters. After that, I, I got a D7200, so I worked my, my body up. So for a long time, I was shooting with a D7200 and a uh, Tamron 150-600, and then I found a, a sale on uh this website for it was the D500 with the 200 500 lens and some other stuff in that in a kit. I was like, oh man, this is exactly what I want, you know. And talking to my wife and convincing my wife that it was exactly what I wanted and what I was needed. And it actually, I mean, that's I still have it and it's a great combo. The D500 with the 200 500, it served me really, really well and it still serves me occasionally. So nowadays I'm shooting with the uh, D850 and I've got the uh, 500 F4 that I use primarily for like birds and whatnot, but I also use, um, you know, when I when I shoot wildlife, you know, moose and, and bigger stuff, I use either the 2470 or the 70 to 200. So, you know, once you really get the photography bug, you know, there's always something you need and I, I started just building my arsenal from there you know after I got that d500 you know I started adding stuff to it so I'm in a good place right now with the kit that I have and uh, you know just I've worked my way up and learned it and moved on and uh, I think that was a really good way for me to learn photography and figure out how how everything works so you were part of this bird group in Alaska did one of those guys kind of become your your mentor photographically yeah. Yeah, a couple of guys did, and, and they actually have become really good friends. One guy is a old retired guy from the Air Force, and then he uh, he worked for the prison system. Um, and uh, his name's Doug Lloyd, just a, a great guy. And he kind of, I don't know, he, he must have saw something in my early work that, that uh, I look back and I kind of miss, you know, like, man, that stuff was terrible, you know. But I guess he saw something, you know, some potential in it. And then uh, my buddy Rob, who I get to shoot with quite often, another retired Air Force guy. Uh, both of them kind of just encouraged me and, you know, just said, keep on, keep on doing it and would give me positive advice. And, you know, Doug would tell me when I was doing something wrong. <laughs> you know, there was a while when my technique and post-processing was, was not good. And uh, Doug called me out on it and told me, so, hey, you're doing this and this and it looks terrible. And so I fixed it. You know, I mean, that's a good friend that'll tell you. <laughs> You know, you're you're doing it wrong. Try something else. So I was just telling Michael before we before we got on tonight that I've been going back through some of my older stuff. And I think if somebody would have been honest with me, I probably would have been uh, taking up knitting or something else because it was it was pretty bad. <laughs> you've you've come a long ways in just five years. I mean, well, no. what? Yeah. Five years. Right. Well, I, I got my first DSLR. I got the D5100 in 2016, so it's it's really been four. That's yeah. amazing. Crazy. 
So I think that mentorship that you had probably really helped. But I also think, I mean, you're a graphic artist by trade, right? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an artist. You know, art. I've done painting and drawing since I was a kid. And then I do graphic design. So I've been working in Photoshop and stuff for a long time. And, you know, I, I do, you know, post-processing classes and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think that plays into it a, a lot, having that kind of eye, you know, the visual eye. We just finished an episode on composition, and I think for someone like you, it, it probably comes a lot more natural to figure that kind of stuff out than some people where you just you just know what looks good, and it's not always this centered image, and you, you just have that ability to create and craft that, that look that you want. Do you, would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. You know, and I've been... Uh really trying to think more about stretching compositions and doing different compositions now, but I'm, I'm always thinking about that. You know, when I'm in the field, if, if the animal gives me the time, you know, then man, you can really just play with your compositions and see like, Oh man, you know, what would really look cool? You know, would a portrait orientation look better here? Sometimes let's face it. Like the critter doesn't always give us that opportunity. You know, it's like you get one or two shots and you know, they're, they're gone. They're moving on. If you can sit and just kind of play with that composition, man, that's that's really cool. That's really fun to do it. So I think one of the things that kind of sets your work apart is your use of light or manipulation, I guess, of the ambient light. And it looks like primarily in camera. How much of that would you say is in camera and how much of it is your post-processing skill? It, it depends on the image. So um, I've worked on some uh, owl images where I did a little bit more with trying to manipulate the light in like Lightroom and, you know, playing with exposing some areas and underexposing other areas to kind of, you know, get that shadow, get that hint of light kind of a thing. You know, you can really do some really dynamic, really interesting things with it. But it, I guess it just depends on the subject. It depends on, um, you know, the, the raw data that I have and, and what it calls for. So... I guess on that owl, I played with it a little bit more because I wanted to give it kind of that, like, like it's on the edge of darkness kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Like you think of owls, like there are these nighttime creatures and once in a while you'll see them, but they're always like, you know, they'll fly back into the, into the forest and you kind of these enchanting kind of creatures. And so I wanted to give it this feeling of being kind of just kissed by the light, if that makes sense, you know, kind of this really nice feel. And so, yeah, so I, I did a little bit of post-processing to, to get it there. It's all, all the data was there. It's just playing with it and manipulating it. That's part of the creative process. So, you know, it's fun to watch and see. And I think nowadays it's, you can do a lot in the camera and then you can do a lot in post-production and it's totally fine, right? The more you can get right in the camera, the less work you have to do in post but it really doesn't matter. If you're a really talented person behind the, the computer, then you might as well just get the basics out in the field and spend your time in front of the computer. Or if you're really talented out in the field, then you just have to spend less time in front of that computer. Like, do you have a preconceived idea when you're out there shooting warblers, for example? Do you just set up and you'll spend, like, a, you'll do all your research and you go to that one spot and you wait and you shoot and you shoot and you shoot till you get that image? Or do you, are you just an opportunistic kind of person where you're just kind of walking through the forest looking for whatever you can find and then key in on that? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I used to be more of the just walk through the forest and see what I could find kind of person. But as I've matured, I think as a photographer, I kind of get something in my head of what I want, kind of visualize, and then I go out there and try to make it happen and I think still having that opportunistic mindset, like setting that aside, like, okay, you know, if something comes in and that I'm not expecting, I want to be able to, to get that, you know, because, uh, you know, you may walk away with it being like, man, I never got to realize the, what I had hoped to. So you have to kind of be open to whatever might come of the situation. But I, I really like to try to make something that I have in my head. I, I like to try to visualize it and then go out and try to try to get that uh, if I can. I just find a lot of joy and, you know, it's a part of the creative process of visualizing something and then making it happen and, and then seeing it in front of your computer screen be like, oh man, I made that, you know, it, there it is. It, it finally, you know, the work that you put into getting stuff like that is worth it. And how many times do you go out and you shoot something with that vision and you come back and you look at it and you're like, 
I'm kind of there, but I, I need more. I need to go back. And I, but then, you know, it's like you said earlier, it's a wild critter. So it doesn't mean that you're going to have that same situation ever again. But do you find that you, you do keep going and keep going and keep refining it in the field? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think that, uh, I, uh, my buddy, uh, Doug, he says that, uh, he's still looking for his favorite shot. You know, he still hasn't taken his favorite shot yet. You know, it's kind of that mentality of like, you gotta just keep going, pushing yourself and, and trying to make something better than the last one. And, uh, I think it's kind of a, that's kind of stuck with me for a long time, you know, just, um, continually trying to push myself and do better and, and work harder for, you know, make more interesting images because, you know, nowadays with so many people that have cameras and with the learning curve, not quite as steep as it was back in film days, you know, anybody can grab a digital camera and, you know, learn photography rather quickly. I mean, you know, I take myself case in point, you know, I mean, I took uh, a photography class back in college, back when it was film, but uh, really, you know, most of what I've learned uh, you know, that was a long time ago, it feels like. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of what I've learned now, you know, has been just the digital. You know, it's it's uh, being able to see what's on the back of my screen. And, you know, I started out, that D5100 that I bought, I, I started out in auto mode, you know, which is terrible. But but I learned, you know, that was something that I, I learned. And, you know, now I've worked my way up to, to manual. You know, I manual everything because I like control of everything. But, um, you know, when I started out, it was like, Man, you know, you you just got to start somewhere. So do what you can, you know. How long do you think it took you to learn, like, depth of field? So when you're out there trying to get these images, you're trying to do that separation, you're trying to figure that stuff out, and you're shooting on auto, at what point did the, the switch get flipped and you're like, oh, if I do this, I can really create that separation? Is that something that came pretty natural, or is that something that you really just had to work on and keep trying and having the right situation or yeah that's a good question too i think uh, you know what i had a lot of influences and i would say one of the influences that i had uh shoots typically wide open with, with bird photography and i really loved his images uh, my friend ray uh, we've gotten to know each other since then you know and um is this ray uh, hennessy yeah yeah ray hennessy yep we just did a podcast with he and ray g Oh, did you? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wildlife Photo Chat. We just did a little cross, <laughs> cross pollination, I guess yeah. you'd call it. <laughs> yeah, they're good guys. Uh, yeah, but very. Yeah, Ray Hennessy and I, uh, you know, developed a friendship, and uh, I was really inspired by him. I still am super inspired by him. His, you know, he's always got some really creative stuff that he's doing, and uh, working really hard at it too. So when it comes to depth of field, you know, he shoots wide open, and I just really love the look of that. So I just was like, you know what, I, I want to really play with that. And that's when I really started to understand it. Uh, I started shooting with aperture priority mode and, uh, you know, just setting it wide open and kind of letting the camera do the rest and, and whatnot. And um, I liked how that looked because, it, it, you know, it really did bring a lot more separation from the foreground to the to the background. And he was talking about like getting low, you know, water on ducks. And I'd never tried that before. So I was like, oh, man, you know, it was I think it must have been like. February or something when he first was talking about that. And that just got me so jazzed up. And I was like, oh man, I can't wait for the ducks to come back. So I'm going to try that. And then when I did, I was just blown away, you know, cause like I was getting some of the images that, is, that, that I had, had same type of stuff with that background is just creamy, you know, buttery smooth backgrounds. And, you know, you can see those on my loons and whatnot. Just, I really liked that look. So yeah, I typically, shoot wide open. Um, I found though that on my uh, F4, my 500 F4, that it, it's a little sharper at 5.6. So I don't quite open it up all the way at F4. Usually it's it's usually at 5.6, but I'm still getting a really nice bouquet there. So, you know, there's always going to be instances where I, I uh, stop down and, you know, increase the depth of field. But uh, for bird photography portraits, I would say, yeah, uh, I usually open it up and as much as my, my lens will allow for sharp images. Can you just really quickly explain the wide open and, and stopping down if you don't mind? Cause I think we get a lot of people to listen to this podcast that sometimes we'll just say these things and we just assume that everybody knows what we're talking about. But if you could just, from your perspective, just explain what that means. Yeah. Uh, took me a long time to learn that stuff. <laughs> so I totally <laughs> get it. 
you know, it's like when I first started, I was like, what are you talking about? What is, what do you, what do you mean by stopping down? You know? Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, somebody explained it like this to me. I think it was really good. It said that, um, you know, your aperture is kind of like your, uh, your iris of your eye. Your shutter speed is your eyelid. And then uh, your, your ISO or ISO or, you know, however you want to pronounce that. It's like putting sunglasses on, you know? And so, in the dark, you know, your your iris opens up because it's letting in a lot more light. And so, uh, you know, with aperture, you know, when you open that up, your your pupil, I guess is your pupil gets really big, not your iris, but your pupil gets the the, the black part <laughs> <laughs> gets really big to let in as much light, you know. And so when that happens, uh, when you open up that to as big as it'll go, you know, whether it's 5.6 or F4 or 2.8 or whatever that that f stop is then uh you know it tends to blur out the backgrounds a lot your your focus plane gets really shallow and uh for those of you that might be confused by that it's the part of the bird or the animal that's in focus is going to be smaller so um i don't know how would you guys describe that that's uh so like yeah, it's just shallow, I, shallower so you're right you know whatever's perpendicular exactly perpendicular to where you're pointing your lens that perpendicular line is your focal plane right yep and then the more you stop it down or close close pupil, your aperture yep yep close the aperture down then that line that plane gets thicker right so you yeah. have more it's, of that animal in focus yeah it's like if you got a moose you know with that long nose you know and you're at f4 you're going to get the eye in focus but the snout you know the tip of the nose is going to be blurry but if you close up that aperture and make the aperture hole smaller, you know, you stop down, then, uh, you know, say like F, F11 or something like that, you might end up with, uh, you know, depends on how close it is, but you'll end up with a sharp nose and eye. So, yeah, it takes uh, time to learn animals and whatnot and what looks good. And I tend to think that if the eye is sharp, then I usually let the rest of it go unless, uh, you know, unless the situation you want the animal all in focus, but I like I like generally a, a shallower depth of field, at least for birds. Mm -hmm. Looking at your images, you can kind of see that, you know, that influence of style at least that Ray Hennessy has. You're you're looking for something unique rather than just looking for a portrait, and I yeah. see that in particular. You know, looking through your Instagram feed, your Pacific loons, Corsair striking bird anyway. But yeah, some of the so. images and some of the light that you've been able to capture those guys in, it makes for a fantastic and really eye-catching image. And then also the swan work that you've done, you know, two things that you'd point out, the light and also you getting down at water level turns those into completely different images also. So how, yeah. do, you, how do you find yourself setting up then when you go into a situation like that? Uh, a lot of it's knowing my area. And I, I, I've just spent a lot of time in my area figuring out where stuff is, where the light is best, and what's going to be there at what times. So I've, I've got a bunch of different ponds that I can go to, and I know what the sun's going to do. Um, I generally know the right time to go there for what I want. If I want backlit or if I want frontlit, I can you know go there at these different times and get what I need. But you know, one thing that Ray does really well that that I really took to as well is uh, and it was inspired by his, his backlit photos. Getting some of that rim lighting and just the magic that happens there, you know, when the sun is just uh, almost, you know, going to go down, you get that red light coming through. And uh, I just really like that. And so anywhere from like golden light down to that red light, I think is really magic. So um, yeah, I've got my places that I've staked out and that I've learned where they are and I make my way there and prepare kind of, you know, kind of check the weather and make sure the conditions are right to be there and then, you know, just make a plan and set it in motion. So loons and uh, and other stuff. I've got a pond actually here close by the house. Well, well within like a 10, 10 minute drive. And uh, I got up at like three in the morning a couple of summers ago because I mean the sun comes up at like four and I wanted to be in position and so I went to this lake and there's a pair of common loons there and I got there and got set up and uh, you know I knew their habits and I knew what they were doing and so uh, as the sun's coming up it's uh, there was this fog coming off the lake and it and when the sun came up it just lit up that fog just just this golden light you know and yeah I got these loons coming in and they were 
they were flapping and doing their stuff and I got just some cool images you know it's just one of those unbelievable times when you're when you get what you were hoping for and more you know so yeah I hope to come I hope they come back this year <laughs> absolutely the Pacific loons would be one that I, I'd make a trip somewhere just particularly to try to photograph that bird because they're gorgeous and all loons are you know they're nice to look at but yeah, those birds are crazy. What percentage of the birds that you photograph are in Alaska? And then, obviously, being a birder and getting that bug, you've probably had a big, a good chance to travel around too, right? So, how much do you do in Alaska? And then, how many trips do you do to the lower forty-eight or somewhere else just to track down other species? Or do you do any at all? Is it all Alaska? I've I've managed to get out here and there. Uh, my last trip, work sent me down to L.A., and you wouldn't think that you've could find much in uh, downtown LA, but I found a couple parks. I had a, a day to myself. We went down there, you know, my coworker went down there for a, a Adobe Max uh, conference. And so I went down a day early and uh, found some city parks and looked and, you know, kind of did my research on uh, what I might find there. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't get a ton, but I got some cool, cool birds that I'd never seen before and was able to kind of get some cool photos. My wife and I went to Mexico 2018, I think. And that was a really cool experience going to Mexico. And I got some really cool stuff there. Been to Hawaii and Florida and, and whatnot. But I guess uh, I don't go specifically out of state for birding or, you know, to shoot birds or anything, although I would. But uh, I haven't yet. It's just kind of I, I end up bringing my camera along, you know, on, on trips that I get to go on. So and then I do uh, do a little research beforehand and figure out where I want to go with the time that I have, but mostly it's, yeah, mostly it's the birds here in Alaska. And, um, you know, I had actually talk going back to loons, uh, last summer I guided some friends up from, uh, uh, from the East coast, a couple of guys, and, uh, we had three loons. It was a three loon day. So I put them on a uh, red throated loon in Anchorage. And then we went photographed, uh, common loons on another lake. And then the next morning we got up super early and went out and photographed Pacific loons and then moose. And we, we saw links cross the road on going up after moose. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a blast. We had a good time and they were happy. So, you know, can't get better than that. No, they better have been happy with that trip. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. And that was, that was in between, you know, their, uh, Lake Clark trip for bears. So they got some cool stuff. So you said that first year you, before you actually got into photography, you had identified 75 different species of birds in Alaska. How many are yep. there? And then what do you, what's your, what's that one thing that you want to go get next? Uh, I think there's around 300 ish. I think my Alaska list right now, I lost track, but I think I've got like 150 or 170 or something that I've identified. Admittedly, I'm less of a birder now and more of a photographer and, uh, Birds will always be my favorite subject, but I've, I've definitely branched out and tried to, you know, get more wildlife in my portfolio. Today, I was on some river otters, which was pretty cool. But uh, what I'd really like to do, I'd love to go to Nome. Nome has got some cool stuff. They've got uh, just a bunch of, you know, shorebirds and uh, golden eagles and other stuff there, blue throats that I'd love to photograph. I'd love to go up to Barrow. Uh, in the summertime too, there's some cool stuff there, king eiders and and spectacled eiders and whatnot. Jerry and I actually went up in October. We went up to Barrow on um, just a we were just you know shotgun trip. Let's go, and uh, we went up after snowy owls and Arctic foxes, and um, we got some we got some snowy owls. So that was pretty cool. Arctic foxes were a little harder to to come by up there, but uh, we found one that was that we could photograph. So talk me through, you had a shot where you kind of utilized a little bit of foreground element to uh, get an image of a snowy that was, I think as the story goes, it was sitting on top of a doghouse. I think <laughs> I read about this, right? Yeah. So there's a man-made object, which yeah. you know, doesn't make for great photo, but in the image that you ended up capturing, you couldn't tell that at all, could you? No, no. And uh, it's funny because Jerry and I were going to like take turns, you know, because one of us had to drive. He had a buddy that lent him uh, his truck, you know, so we're driving around. All he showed us where to drive to and where to go. And the light was failing us and we were about to pack it in. And 
we see this snowy owl sitting on his doghouse in between a couple houses. And I said, hey, man, it's your turn. You want to go for it? And he's like, <laughs> nah, nope. You know, it just it didn't look like anything, you know. And I, I thought, all right, well, I don't see snowy owls all the time. I'm just going to go for it. Most of the owls up there were pretty uh, skittish, you know. Uh, not easy to get up on. But this guy stayed put. Let me crawl. So I'm crawling through the snow because I don't want to scare him off. So I'm crawling as low as I could. And uh, uh, and I creep behind this berm of snow. And I could pop my head up and see this owl. And I noticed that, hey, there's uh, a white snowbank behind this owl if I if I uh, am in this one particular spot. And so, But I hated the doghouse. You know? And so then I figured out that if I... If I drop down a little bit behind, you know, it really figuring out where my angle was and, and where everything lined up. But I figured out that if I could do it right and get in the, just the right angle, I could get the, the snow berm that was in front of me. Uh, I could get that in the foreground, get rid of that doghouse, still get a white background, and then kind of get the head of the owl and, the, and some of the upper body and then, you know, that snow berm washed everything else out um and then in post-processing you know i just uh, brightened up those whites and um, uh, saturated the eye a little bit and uh you know just kind of fixed some of the it was a bit noisy you know so i had to work on that a little bit but yeah it turned out pretty cool i was really happy with it and uh, you know you would have never known that opportunity was there if you didn't go check it out so you right. know i think sometimes it takes just going you know you never know if you don't go I bet you Jerry won't pass up on the next chance he gets to go before you. <laughs> well, it's yeah. I, you know what? I showed him what I had gotten, and he was like, "Oh man!" And so he went down there and tried to get it, but he the owl wasn't as patient. Uh, I think it saw me. I was I was kind of standing up behind this building, and I think it got wind of me, and and he flew before Jerry could get a shot of him. But what are you gonna do? <laughs> is what it is. Huh? It is what it is. Yeah. When you go out with buddies, it's kind of nice to get the shot, you know, get some shots that not everybody else has too, right? You just want to, yeah. it's kind of nice to have your own and he'll have that opportunity again. And I mean, you guys, it's just good to, to let that happen every now and then just so everybody doesn't have all the same shots. Yeah, it's funny because last time Jerry and I went out, uh, we went looking for links and, uh, and we found them. So we're on this trail that had just been snowed over and uh, we're both watching the trail because stepping off. The trail means you're post holing, you know, up past your knee, and that's no fun. So we're kind of trying to watch the trail while trying to watch, you know, the surroundings, and which is difficult balance that we we're trying to do. So Jerry's like ten feet in front of me or something, and I happen to look up in time to see this lynx, this female lynx, off in the snow to, to our right. And so I kind of Jerry, <laughs> hey, you know, I had to I had to be a little bit loud so he'd hear me. And, and then I pointed and, and I saw him looking around. And then as soon as his eyes lit up, I knew he'd seen the lynx, you know. So so we went after this uh, female lynx and we got some shots of her. And uh, and the, the male lynx was, you know, he's hot after her. And he stayed back in the brush uh, quite a bit uh, back away from us. Well, she went off after uh, she, she posed for us in a few different places. And then she went off on the trail and, and kept going. Well, this lynx, this uh, male lynx decided to circle around and I could see where he was going. He was going to come back up on the trail behind us. So I told Jerry what he was going to, you know, I, hey, I think this, this lynx is going to pop back up on the trail back over here. I think we should get down and get off the trail and, you know, get ready. So we did, you know, both of us got down and sure enough, he did exactly what I thought he was going to do. You know, he popped right back up on the trail and then he faced us, gave us both a front on look at, at him. And then off the trail again, and both of our cameras are clicking. It's we we both got the exact same shot, you know, which is, you know, it is what it is. But uh, we're like, all right, now who's going to enter into the contest? And you know, <laughs> if we enter anything into a contest, you know, it's going to be like, hey, wait, you guys got the same images, you know what I mean? So you know, it was a cool image, I think, but uh, it was a cool experience just being able to experience that together, you know, and and get that links and it's just amazing those creatures are just so incredible so really grateful that you know i was even able to get it in the first place but yeah it you know sometimes getting you get the same shot as your buddy and that happens <laughs> oh yeah yep. it happens a lot but that's yep. where you know and in that situation too you don't have a lot of chances to you know if you're photographing moose you can go someone can go 20 yards this way and someone can go 20 yards this way and 
at least you're getting different angles. You might be getting the same moose, but it's something yeah. different. But in that situation, you guys are on the same trail and you don't have a lot of places to go anyway. So it's it's going to yeah. happen. And and a lot of times I'd rather be photographing with someone, you know, just to have the company and, and have an extra set of eyes, especially with links, right? Yeah. It's hard to go out there by yourself. And I mean, plenty of people do it, but it's mostly by luck. It's not, you know, someone spotting the links like you did. You know, it just might be yeah. they run out in front of you or something. So that's kind of cool. What do you do with your images? Uh, you said something about contests. Do you publish in magazines as well, or what are you doing? Let's see. I've been, uh, let's see, you guys are familiar with Alaska Magazine. Sure. Uh, I entered a couple images last year. Um, I didn't win. I got third place and a runner-up, which just kind of fuels my fire to enter it this year and try to win. But uh yeah, there's a couple of magazines. There's also uh, National Wildlife Federation has a contest that I, I'm running down the clock on. I think it's done at the end of March. So I need to throw a few images in there. I haven't been published besides Alaska Magazine and a local magazine that I got a cover on. I haven't had any, uh, you know, big national published photos in any of them. But, uh, you know, I hope so. I hope sooner or later that happens. You know, it's it's... <laughs> The photography market's pretty saturated, so you really got to stand out and and have really good stuff to get there. So, right, I see some stuff up on the wall behind you. Do you print a lot of stuff for uh, like shows and that sort of thing too, or do you just do that for yourself? Let's see. There's uh, most of these are are printed on uh, foam core. Uh, I've got a buddy that has a big, large format printer, and he printed them there. And and these we have this festival in in uh, I think it's February. Uh, called Fur Ronde, and it's a big, you know, fun festival here, and a lot of stuff happens in Anchorage and whatnot. And one of the malls puts on a Fur Ronde photo contest, and they require, you know, a certain size uh, mounted on foam core. And so I just have them. I just have my buddy print it directly on foam core. So that's what these are. These are uh, contest entries that um, I had to go and pick up, and decide to put them on my wall afterwards. So, um, but this. Uh, this links here, that's a links that I got last year at the uh, locally, but it's the same links as Jerry and I saw. And the only reason I know that is because he's got like this, this little scar on his nose. And uh, when I was looking at my photos from uh, a couple weeks ago with Jerry, I noticed this links had a scar on his nose and I thought he looked familiar. So I pulled up last year's photos and sure enough, he's got that same scar right on his nose. So. Yeah, uh, pretty cool to photograph the same links two years in a row. Oh, absolutely. And we were just talking about that, I think, what, a couple of weeks ago, Michael, about kind of identifying some of these individuals. And uh, I think it was on the podcast with Brooke Little Bear. So how you can identify these individuals and how you can kind of, you know you're going to have a good shoot if you find this same fox or lynx or yeah. coyote because they're just a lot more tolerant yeah so you'll once you identify them you'll spend the time with them yeah that's that's nice this links here has given me uh fantastic photo ops both years i mean he uh, you know this photo back here he came out and he was he was hot after a, a female and he he climbed up on this snowbank and it's snowing out you know lightly snowing and he just sits down on the snowbank with a, just a clean trees behind him and uh, just sat there, you know, and it was just like, man, they came unbelievable, you know, just sitting there posing for me. And then, you know, coming up on the trail here recently and just giving me what what he gave me this time. It's just like, man, you're just the most photogenic links I've ever seen, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty thrilled. Pretty awesome to live in a place like Anchorage and have links and moose and loons and all of this kind of really spectacular wildlife that a lot of people in the lower 48 are, would love to shoot, but that's something that you get to shoot almost every day. You know, you have that opportunity. You don't necessarily get to shoot it every day, but at least you have the opportunity to go out. It's just kind of a cool place to be, and it's something that we all, I think, dream about. Yeah, I, I, I count myself pretty uh, pretty blessed to be able to live here. And I, li I actually live in Eagle River, which is just uh, 15 miles or so north of Anchorage. Which gives me, uh, it's it's great because it actually gives me access to the Matsu Valley. There's a place called Hatcher's Pass, which is uh, up the mountains a little bit in, uh, you know, just, just north of here. And it's a perfect place for ptarmigan and pika and marmots and, 
you know, a bunch of other stuff. Golden Eagles are up there and Hawks and whatnot. So I've guided people up there uh, several times and uh, it's just a really great place to go, you know. And so living in Eagle River, you know, it's not such a long drive from Anchorage, but then, you know, I commute every day, you know, going to work to Anchorage. And so I, I you know, I have access to all of that. And, you know, I don't have to go far usually to find some cool stuff. One of the reasons that I wanted to have you on the show is just to kind of discuss what you do, because I think there are people in our audience that might not be able to take these extravagant trips, but there's opportunities right in your backyard a lot of times uh, that we haven't necessarily taken advantage of. So being a birder specifically, what are some of the things that you do to prepare for the spring and the the species that are coming back each year? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I was actually just talking about, I, w- I did a live video earlier today on Facebook and uh, it's kind of talking about my, my backyard setup. So I've got a deck that I can just step off from, got a uh, bird feeder up there, but you know, it's just not a bird, it's not just a bird feeder. It's also, you know, I've put up perches and uh, kind of strategically put up you know, various things for birds to come down and perch on. And so, you know, times when you may be stuck at home or something, you know, you can just go out to your backyard or or go off to your deck, spend a little time into uh, creating something that the birds are going to enjoy, you know, put out black oil sunflower seeds, put out soot cages, put out, uh, you know, in some of the lower 48 places, uh, you know, sometimes they'll put out oranges for Orioles or, you know, uh, fruits or berries or something like that that'll draw in you know figure out what these different birds like put it out there offer it up for them and then you know put out some cool places for them to perch on you know whether that's a cherry blossom tree or you know just a flowering tree or something with some cool moss on it you know what I mean like there's a lot of a lot of stuff you can do just from your backyard and uh, you can just sit down and, and wait for the birds to come to you. You know, rather than going on an extravagant trip that you may not have the money for or, or the time for, you know, you can get a lot of cool stuff, just beautiful images right from your backyard. You know, and I've, I've done that a lot, just playing with the stuff that I have. You know, there's times when, you know, I've got two kids that are pretty small still and plus a full time job. So I don't get to go on a lot of trips. You know, my trips are uh, here and there and uh, when I get an opportunity to go. But uh, some of the times I'm just like, man, you know, you get that itchy trigger finger and you got to do something. So it's like, man, I'm just going to I'm going to pop out on the deck here for you know a little while. And, uh, you know, I, I usually get in the wintertime, I get pine grosbeaks and I get nut hat, red breasted nut hatches and red poles and chickadees and boreal chickadees and, um, you know, just a woodpeckers. And then the summertime, you know, I get other stuff and. Uh, when the warblers come back, you know, I'll, I'll often get, you know, rub, yellow rumped warblers and uh, orange crowned warblers and, you know, just these beautiful birds that are migrating back up. So, uh, and stellar jays too. I get stellar jays, which they're a super cool bird, you know, really beautiful, kind of obnoxious bird, but uh, they're, they're a lot of fun. So, <laughs> you know, I've got some areas that I go and look for some of the birds when they're returning, you know, the warblers and thrush and whatnot. And, uh, uh, let's see, we're we're closing in on April, which means the very thrush are going to be coming back. And uh, they're one of the first thrushes to, to arrive back besides the robins. And they're just a beautiful bird. And they've got this kind of ethereal kind of weird song. You know, if, uh, if the listeners want to like YouTube, a uh, very thrush song, just really beautiful. It's 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 kind of synth. You know, like it's it's hard to describe their sound, but it's really cool. Um, and also, you know, if, if anybody wants to check out what the Swainson's Thrush sounds like, you can you can find that on YouTube too. Swainson's Thrush song. Uh, that's what first got me into birding was just that song. You know, I had to know what it was, uh, which you know got me into photography. And you know, here we are. I still, you know, there's I've got a soft spot for for birds and bird song and whatnot. So I'm looking forward to migration. So a quick story about Jamie. We were photographing in the same place and we were walking down a trail one day and um, he's paying as much attention to what he's hearing as what he's seeing. You know, he'll hear a bird song of some sort and he'll be like, oh, that's a whatever (laughs) <laughs> and then his focus is on that bird. You know, we're all still keyed in on the moose because we have no clue what this bird is going on <laughs> over here. But he, Jamin knows, and he's just 
okay, I'm going to go figure this out and go get good pictures of this. And he comes back with really cool stuff. I'm just out there looking for moose. So it's really cool to take that time to figure out that kind of stuff. I mean, I know a few of the songs and I can figure out a few of the things that are going on, but what you, the knowledge you have with all those different sounds and those little triggers that you find out when you're out there that really help us do what we do and it helps you get those images. Because if you didn't know what that song was, it's very easy to walk down the trail and just completely miss it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I think it goes back to something Ron was saying earlier about being opportunistic. I think you always have to kind of have that opportunistic mindset, at least uh, be open to that, you know, if it pops up, if the unexpected, or if you're saying like learning bird calls and, and knowing what's what and, and listening for it. So that's a really key part of uh, my outdoor experience because I, I've discovered stuff. You know, I, I was uh, a couple of years ago, I was listening to a Stellar Jay squawk in the woods. And he was, this guy was just carrying on like crazy. And I was like, all right, what's this guy doing, you know? So I went and investigated and found a boreal owl that he was squawking about, you know? So, you know, you know, I found so many owls just because I was listening to what the other birds were telling me. So, yeah, I think it pays off to kind of learn some of that stuff and learn what the birds are telling you and, and what kind of birds they are. Because it may be something, you know, you may be able to make a cool opportunity out of it. There's a few apps out there in this world, too, that you can actually learn some of these calls, right? It's not like something where you just have to, I mean, YouTube's a good resource and there's, I know there's yeah. some apps. I don't know how good they are because I just don't use them enough, but maybe you could yeah. re recommend an app or two that people could use to help just kind of learn these songs. Or if you're out in the woods, isn't there something where you can actually let it record that sound or that song and then it'll actually tell you what kind of bird that was? I think so. I don't use that, though, uh, although it would be helpful at times. Um, the one that I started out using the most is uh, Sibley's Guide to Birds. Uh, it's got a lot of recordings in it, and uh, you can you know, read about them and, and play their songs and kind of learn. What I found is uh, a lot of birds have different dialects. For example, uh, you, know, you might get a fox sparrow in, in Homer, Alaska, that sounds completely different, you know, than a, a fox sparrow in, in my neck of the woods, you know, uh, Anchorage area. You know, just that difference in dialect. There's, you know, if you if you're really paying attention and kind of know the general sound, you can tell that both of them are a fox sparrow. But uh, I bring that example up because a couple of years ago, when I was, you know, still learning a lot. Well, of course, we're all still learning, right? I'm, I'm still learning, certainly. But I was really, you know, the learning curve was was uh, in full steep mode, right? And I was learning what a fox sparrow sounded like. And I heard this bird in the morning in Homer, and I just couldn't tell you what it was. It perplexed me. It just drove me nuts. I was like, man, what is that thing? Finally found it, and it was a fox sparrow. I was like, well, I know what a fox sparrow sounds like. How is that a fox sparrow, you know? But that's when I learned the different dialects, you know, and then I started paying attention to that and started learning, you know, that, hey, so you know what? Some birds might sound a little bit different you know, from one place to another. What's cool about Sibley's is it'll kind of clue you into some of that. I should have been paying a little bit more attention, but it'll have like uh, Yellow Rumped Warbler, uh, Washington's WA, Washington State, or Yellow Rumped Warbler AK, you know. So it'll tell you where it was recorded in. So if they sound a little bit different, you can kind of chalk it up to uh, different dialects, different areas that kind of, you know, they take on their own kind of thing. So but yeah, it takes a long time to learn that stuff and learn bird sounds. Uh, I've spent a lot of time listening. I kind of have the same issue when I'm talking to Mike or Doug Gardner about uh, video and learning about video. They're saying the same thing, but one of them just has a really thick southern accent. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there any difference in the loons? I mean, can you tell from the sound of a loon that it's a Pacific or if it's a common or, or are they all pretty similar? The Pacific and the common have similarities, uh, but they're very different. Yeah, they're, um, let me put it this way. You could tell that they're loons by hearing them, but, but very different sounds. Yeah, very different. Well, I want to hang out with you this, this summer in Alaska. I'd love to hang out with you and just even just for the learning the songs. I mean, cause that, that would be a huge way to learn is have a mentor out there with you that when you hear a song or, you know, it's, and it's probably something we hear a lot, right? Yep. If you're walking around, you're going to hear this stuff, but you just out of sight, out of mind. But if you're keying in on it, 
I think that really starts yeah. to help out. The other thing I'd like to do is one of my favorite birds to record audio of is ptarmigan. If you get in the area, you know, where you got some good ptarmigan activity, they, the sounds they make is just yeah. it's spectacular. It's just amazing to sit there and yeah. listen to those guys. Last year, I was photographing moose, and uh, there were some ptarmigan across the valley, and they were going just crazy, just talking and squawking and doing all the stuff that they do. And, of course, I didn't have any audio equipment with me at the time, but the next day, and you don't hear a thing, but you know they're there. And so I just want to get in those areas where we can find some ptarmigan and try to get some of those really cool recordings just because it's i don't think that many people are that familiar with what unless you're a big time birder unless you live in a place where there's ptarmigan around you would be amazed to hear what they sound like yeah it's funny when people have never heard ptarmigan before and they hear them for the first time they're like what is that you know because it's just it's so weird man it's just like such a funny kind of sound that they make but uh willow ptarmigan and uh rock ptarmigan are both just kind of have these weird sounds you know weird uh vocalizations that they do but uh you know you both of you guys have an open invitation if you want to go I'll, I'll take you my secret pacific loon spot and uh get you some nice loon photos so we'll make a trade out of that yeah all right fair enough get you to wyoming get you some grouse species that you don't have in alaska so yeah, yeah. that'd be good trade i'd like some pronghorns too so Oh, have- we can get you that right in town. They're all over the oh, place. Oh, really? Last year, I was sitting in Ron's office. We were doing a podcast up in Wyoming before we were doing a sage grouse shoot, and we look out the window, and there's a pronghorn walking down the street right from his office. So They walk through the drive through every day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's that's incredible. <laughs> it's like our moose. We had a, We had a moose that went into a hotel a couple of years ago here in Anchorage and you know this it's funny they'll just you know they go where they want all right so Jamin greatly appreciate you coming on the show I heard you on uh, Ray and Ray's podcast the wildlife photo chat and I thought you were a great guest and I thought you'd have a lot to uh, to share with our guests as well and I hope that you've stuck around and please uh, Jamin go ahead and tell everybody where to find you on Instagram and on website yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you guys having me on the show. Uh, love to talk about you know wildlife and photography. Uh, definitely a passion of mine. I, I love to be able to share that passion with every other people that uh, share it. You know, so um, let's see. Yeah, I'm on Instagram j dot hunter underscore photo, and then uh, I've got a YouTube channel too. I've done a few uh, videos where you know taking take myself out and uh, record, you know, what I'm after, done moose and stuff. I also do post-processing tutorials on there. So if anyone's interested in in some of that, I take an artistic approach with my post-processing. There's a lot of people who do a more natural, you know, and they want it more documentative style. But, um, you know, I don't have a problem removing a branch if it's in the way and, and distracting from my subject, you know what I mean? Um, I want my subject to be presented, you know, in a, in as nice a way as I can. So we have the tools to do that. Uh, let's see, I'm on Flickr. I don't know if anybody else is on Flickr, but I've got a Flickr account. Let's see, uh, Jamin Hunter Taylor. You can find me on there. Facebook is, uh, uh, facebook.com slash J dot Hunter dot picks P I C S. And then, uh, you know, I've got a few other ones around, but those are the main ones. So, all right, we'll have a great night up there, and thanks. Hopefully, Lord willing, we'll all see each other soon, be able to get in the field, uh, because I am already tired of being cooped up indoors, and I haven't even been given the order yet completely. But yep, I hear you. Well, if uh, you know, if you guys get up here, we'll, we'll you know can do some of this in person. It'll be fun. Perfect. Thanks again for your time. Yeah, and thank you. Thanks. To Missy McKenzie, if you look <laughs> over Mike's right shoulder, made a guest appearance tonight, actually, <laughs> on the podcast. She's been missing in action for the, the past couple, but Missy is always working behind the scenes. Thank you for your hard work, and thank you all for listening to another episode of Wild and Exposed. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in.
gonna make it someday Nothing's gonna get in our way We will be the biggest band in town 